If you ever want to sound like the smartest person in the room, just talk about transient liquid phase centering. Odds are, nobody else will have a clue what you're talking about. But Dr. John Boltitude would, and he has the patents to prove it. Officially, he's a VP and technical fellow at Kemet Electronics. Unofficially, he's the resident mad scientist, and while he hasn't invented a flux capacitor as far as we know, he has helped us get one step closer with Kemet Connect. Welcome to Tech Chats, John. Thanks very much. Um, I do have some claims on the flux capacitor, but I think that, think they were taken by a film or something. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Kemet Connect. Aside from possibly furthering time travel, what's its purpose? The issue that this product at a high level is trying to solve is the lack of board space when you try and miniaturize power design. And that's really what we focus the Kemet Connect technology on. And it tries to address the headaches that designers have as they, you know, they have a solution, but to realize a product, they really need to reduce the board space for the ceramic capacitors. All right. So what exactly is Kemet Connect? Kemet Connect is a high density packaging technology. It's really designed to allow the more capacitance in the same board space. This high density packaging technology allows us to stack components together without leads. And they can be mounted by standard pick and place with SAC lead free reflow processing. And once the customer has it, they can simply mount it the way they would normally mount an MLCC. And how is that bond formed? And how does it compare to stacks built with a lead frame? Yeah, more traditionally, stack capacitors of this type have been used to lead frames to hold the capacitors together with a solder joint. This technology, as you you mentioned in the intro, uses a transient liquid phase sintering technology. And if you look at the picture here, this shows the joint where the terminations of the multi-layer ceramic capacitors are bonded together with a copper tin TLPS material in here. So there is no lead. And this works really because the bond formed is very high temperature. It also has similar conductivity to the solder and it has a very high shear strength, so very high mechanical strength. The way we do this is we actually react a material between the terminations. In this case, we are bonding MLCCs together Together, but but it can actually work for most components. What do you mean when you say you're reacting a metal matrix to form the bond? Yeah, so I'm like, um, let me draw an analogy perhaps with a, with a solder that is usually used to mount the components. So solder is a metal mixture that typically melts when you solder it and then it cools down and solidifies. This material works differently because it's actually a reaction. So what in this copper tin TLPS, there are actually materials that when we heat them up, they are low melting point, particularly uh, say the tin is low melting point, 232 Celsius, and it reacts with the copper and some other ingredients to form this high temperature bond. Once it's reacted, it doesn't melt any longer at that low melting point of 232 Celsius it's actually much higher melting because it's reacted to another phase. Okay, so you're able to bond at a low temperature, but then get the high temperature properties in the finished product? Exactly, and the high temperature performance is very important because we want to mount these using a SAC reflow, the actual uh, connect stacks. We couldn't bond these with a SAC solder instead of the TLPS because it would simply remelt when we surface mounted the component. You've mentioned high shear strength here, which is obviously critical in rugged applications. So can you talk about the mechanical performance? Certainly. Just by way of example, um, we've looked at the shear strengths, both of the TLPS joint and once the part is bonded onto a board through SAC reflow soldering. So here's a couple of case sizes that we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about in the following slides. But on the left-hand side, you see the TLPS shear strength. This is where we measure the strength that's bonding the two MLCCs together you just saw. And in this case, I've shown um, some peak force values 
with temperature. And you can see there is a, a, a slight decline as we move to higher temperatures. So in the case of the 1812 size, at 125C, it's about four kilograms of force to, that it takes to break those two MLCCs apart. Now, that may sound like a small amount when you look in, the, in these uh, diagrams, but actually it's very high. By example, if I was selling our military grade space level stacks, the shear strength for the leads required at 25C is actually 2.25 kilograms. So it's actually a lot higher, even at elevated temperatures than is typically required for leaded components. On the right hand side, we show what force is required to get the part off of the circuit board pads we mounted to. And you can see in the case of the 3640, in many, you know, it's around 90 kilograms or more force, which is, to put that in context, that's more weight than many people, right? So it takes a lot of force to remove the surface mounted connect from a board. Now, the technology is interesting, of course, but what does it mean in terms of actual products? So far, we have really focused on using this technology in Class 1 MLCCs and really Class 1s for power electronics. So you can see in the capacitance change with temperature graphs, there's really no change in COG. And the Class 1 U2J is also linear. So why, why are the class ones interesting in power? If you look at the table here, they have many attributes that make them very interesting for use in power. But the one issue that class one has com in comparison to a typical class two X7R is that you can't get the same capacitance value or as high a capacitance value in a given case size. So to address this, what we've done is we've used that connect technology to facilitate more capacitance in a given board space and get all the benefits of these other capacitor characteristics. And this has been done for Chemic Connect U2J and uh, more recently Chemic Connect KC Link for Class 1 in Power Electronics. So let's talk about each of those examples you mentioned, the U2J and the KC Link. Yes, certainly. Let's talk about the Chemic Connect U2J. This was really our first application in this technology. It was developed for switch tank resonant converters to step down from 48 volts to 12 volts in data center. You can see that there's something that says standard here. This is like a standard orientation for a stack, okay? But on the far right here is the low loss orientation. And the reason I'm talking about this, the low loss is much more capable in these resonant type applications. It can handle a lot more ripple current. To show this, if you look at this ripple current capability graph versus frequency, at 300 kilohertz, this is the same part, but you can see that the low loss orientation can handle three times the ripple current of the standard orientation. And if you look on the right, this shows a test that we ran at, um, where we measure the IR after the parts are exposed for 2000 hours at 105 Celsius with a 25 volt bias and, and actually 30 amps. RMS at 300 kilohertz. This is in the low loss orientation. To try and explain why the low loss orientation is, is much better, we have to look at the power that is dissipated. The power loss is related to the current that's applied, squared, and the resistance. In this case, the resistance is the equivalent series resistance, ESR. And you can see on this frequency scan of ESR, there's a big gap between the standard and low loss orientations. The low loss is almost a quarter of, of what it is in the standard orientation. And this has a huge impact on the ripple current heating of the path. If you can see the thermal image here, in the standard orientation, it starts to heat up a lot. Whereas in the low loss, because of the low ESR, there's less power dissipated and it stays cold. Today, in power, everyone wants to develop a more efficient system, a less power-hungry system, 
And in order to do that, you want to use the power, not lose it as heat. So as part of that, you can see in this application, the switch tank converters actually have nearly 99% efficiency. And these are 500 to 1,000 watt converters typically. Why do you get lower loss when you flip the stack on its side? Basically, what you have is a low ESR because you have a, a shorter distance between the opposed pads. I try and think about this as the electrons going from one pad to the other. In the standard orientation, they have to go up one side and down the other. It's a lot longer length, and that adds to the equivalent series resistance. Okay, so then what about your other product, KC Link? You know, as a prelude to the Connect, well, just a, a, a few words on the KC Link. These, these uh, were developed using our COG dielectric, and uh, we saw a need for a higher temperature rating in the industry. So uh, 100, these are rated to 150 uh, degrees Celsius. And... As I said, for class one, they have the benefits of no capacitance change with voltage. This is, uh, shows the, uh, a typical uh, result for the 3640.22 microfarad 500 volt KC link. And it really doesn't change even if you apply 500 volts. You have the same capacitance. That, that's not true if you go in and buy a class 2X7R, okay? Um, also, they can handle high uh, ripple currents at high frequency, and this shows a couple of results for that same 0.22 microfarad part, where um, we look at frequencies going to, you know, through 100, um, 200, and 300, and, and really we're, ha we're handling at, at 125C, we're, we're handling at 12 amps. 150 kilohertz here, and and if at, at uh, 105 we can even take that up, you know, above 15 amps RMS at that frequency, which is very high. And this this um, operate this is uh, shown with an operating voltage of a 400 volt DC bias on these parts, so they can handle the DC bias and a lot of ripple to. Uh, <coughs> to take the, um, the overshoot out of the, of the circuit. So these were really developed and are suitable for wide band gap applications. But the issue is we still need more CAM. On the right hand side, you can see an equation. I, I won't dwell on it too much. So it's capacitance versus the power versus the ripple voltage. So using this equation, you can try to understand how much capacitance you need in a DC link capacitor. In this case, this example running at 400 volts, we want to suppress the 10% ripple. You can see at lower frequencies, you know, 20 kilohertz through maybe like 50 kilohertz, you need a lot of capacitance into the tens or hundreds of microfarad as shown in this red box, which is typically supported by film or electrolytic type capacitors. But as the frequency increases, the amount of capacitance comes down. So with like 100 kilohertz, you're at a, like a one microfarad for a 10 kilowatt application, but you still need one microfarad. And you can see in 50 kilowatts, you need going on seven microfarads here. So you still need a lot of microfarads, but they're actually more in line with ceramic capacitors. Of course, in the case of the KC link, we only have a 0.22 microfarad. So you would need to place a lot of those in order to get to these values. But this is the power range we're, we're really looking at as an example of where the parts are applied. So to address the capacitance in it, and reduce the board space, we can take those 3640 case size MLCCs and connect them. In addition to the low ESR, there's a couple of other important benefits of this that have to be uh, noted and are important for power. One is the inductance is significantly lower in the low loss orientation. High inductances can actually result in more ripple, the parts seeing more ripple and, and having more problems. 
Also, if by moving to this low loss orientation, we increase the self-resonant frequency. And so there is a broader range of frequency in which the part can be used. You can see in the low loss orientation, all four parts are connected to the solder pad. So we don't have these multiple resonant peaks that you see in the standard orientation. So we've got higher self-resonant frequency and we've got lower equivalent series inductance. And to try and explain that in sort of somewhat simple terms, I've drawn this diagram here where the inductive loop, in the case of a low loss, it's a very short distance for the electrons to go through that loop. Whereas in the standard orientation, it's a very long loop to the final electrode up here. If we take a look at this in terms of what can this do for board space versus the KC link, this shows a resonant application actually and how many capacitors we would need in the KC link. So you can see it's a 17 and a half inches, so there's quite a lot of board space. Whereas if I connect them, you can see the area comes down to almost a quarter what it was. Of course, the height has gone up somewhat, but in most applications, there is room to move on the height. So beyond those two MLCCs, I'm sure you're going to use Connect on other products. Can you share anything that's on the roadmap? We've already developed the Connect Class 1 MLCC for Power Electronics, the U2J, and Connect KC Links. This is a versatile high density packaging technology and we are extending these to other case sizes. To get back to your point, we can also use these for other types of MLCC and we can go back to the class 2X7R MLCCs and this has also been qualified 2A CQ200 actually in the 1812 case size and that's due to launch in July. And this chart kind of shows our progression and from U2J to KC Link Connect, we've got some high voltage class 2 X7R Connect. And eventually, as well as launching capacitors, this technology can be applied to other components. We can use it to integrate components into filters and the like and put different components together in a small space. And ultimately, we can assemble modules using a variance of this patented technology. You mentioned integrating different types of components, which could have more benefits than just saving board space, we right? We can stack uh, a capacitor with an inductor, or, or actually uh, we can put a resistor on top of a, a stack. This can add value. Obviously, it reduces the, the board space once again, but it, it can actually eliminate some parasitics from the performance and improve the performance of, say, a filter or something like this. That can be done quite effectively with this technology. All right. Well, thank you, John, for sharing a bit about Connect. And while it might not make time travel possible, it sure seems like something we'll see more of in the future. And if you'd like to learn more about capacitors based on Kemet's Connect technology, click the links in the description or visit mauser.com. And be sure to check back soon for the next episode of Tech Chats. Mm -hmm.